everyone. I'm Lauren from arc.dev, a platform that makes your job search easier. We connect software developers with fast growing uh, companies for remote work opportunities. And I'm really excited to welcome you to the first segment of Remote Career Success Week with Tim Zalman, Director of Engineering at GitLab. Um, and we will open up, I'm going to interview him first, we'll have our little chat, and then about 15 minutes before the end of this hour long segment, we will open up to questions from the audience. So feel free, you can ask your questions in the stage chat at any time, and we'll check them out at the end of our talk. And I hope you all enjoy it. So let's give our silent, you know, virtual round of applause to Tim and welcome him to our virtual stage. So, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again for the invitation. And I'm also very excited to be um, got the first slot because it's already good evening on this side of the world. So seven o'clock here. And um, yeah, looking forward to our chat. Great. So since this um, the summit is all about finding a remote job and your job search interviews and everything, I'd like to start this off instead of um, giving you the long introduction of Tim, we'll start it off with that very familiar um, job interview question, which is very simple, but actually one of the most difficult questions to answer. So can you tell me about yourself and give us your 30 second elevator pitch? I will try my best. Uh, this is a classic one. And Yes, so my name is Tim Simon. I'm from Vienna, Austria. Um, I am a software engineer, software manager, and by now a director of engineering here at GitLab. Um, I uh, have seen, I would say, all the different types of um, software engineering that you can do in different roles, starting really from engineering to being in big companies, being a classic consultant, being a freelancer, having web and software agencies, games company to being yeah director of engineering in a couple of uh, roles um, in the past and now also here at GitLab and seeing really the different stages both in big enterprises big startups as GitLab is by now and also smaller startups and smaller projects and endeavors and um, yeah and I'm, I'm, my, my main target is to really build great teams um, and um, one of my biggest um, experiences is really scaling teams and scaling software. So uh, what I have done um, here at GitLab is I scaled a couple of times different teams and sub departments. I did this also before. My last job was, for example, for a huge uh, bank here in Austria um, and really scaling teams, scaling software and building products um, that I also like uh, to use and enjoy. Uh, that's basically where I am. Great. So I'm actually going to chime in here and say that that Tim, if you're looking for an engineering job, especially at GitLab, Tim is the perfect person to ask because I know you've mentioned earlier to me that you interview. How many engineers do you interview every week at your current job? So currently we are quite fully staffed in my sub department, but especially last year we have grown from 32 people to 96 people over the year. Uh, so this is. Uh, a huge scaling that we have seen just in my sub department and that meant really hundreds of interviews. I think I looked it up at some point where 300 to 400 interviews in this 18 months or so. And sometimes it was really 10 to 13, 14. Inter I think 14 was 14 or 15 was my highest in one week um, that we interviewed for um, both engineers. So I'm interviewing both engineers, but also engineering managers from my teams. Um, and yeah, yeah we enjoyed good. it. <laughs> yeah. You're the perfect person um, for us to pick your brain on engineering interviews and remote um, interviews in general. So I guess before we dive into the, the good stuff, um, I, I'd just love, love for you to recap uh, what you told me about how you started off in your engineering career and also tell us a little bit about how you ended up um, in the remote work world. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of years ago, I would say 10, um, I was working with my startup for a Canadian startup. And back in the days, it was my first fully 100% remote role. I never met the people that were leading that company in person. It was for a logistics company. And I was basically their CTO for while they were building up the business for over 10, 11 months. Um, I, 
completely different role than what I'm doing now, but I really enjoyed back then really working more globally on one hand and having a little bit more flexibility and reducing especially commute and, and topics like that to an absolute minimum. Um, and I had exactly the opposite of what I had now in my last row, which was big, really nice office, but, but classic open floor office, lots of people, tons of uh, meetings, tons of uh, disturbances simply by people knocking on your shoulder. Um, and when I, I, when I said, okay, I'm leaving there, I had a very clear focus on the remote role. Why? Because with the previous experience of working remote, seeing on the other hand that more and more companies are not only just having people that are sitting somewhere and the rest is sitting in the office, but going really this all remote route that GitLab was doing, I found really interesting. And to some extent, yeah, my, my life focus changed a little bit. Back then, um, I was expecting my first son. Um, so I said, okay, remote might be really the, the, the best choice here to, to not have the same situation that I, I had in my office job, which would have been that I leave the house at 8.30 in the morning and I come back at 7 and perhaps say good morning and good night. And I definitely didn't want to, uh, to have that. I wanted to exchange this to combine what I love um, in work, but also really have the time and the flexibility for the family and for, for the kid. And yeah, and then I got through all the rounds with GitLab was, that is almost four years ago. And two weeks later, my first son was born and um, the, uh, the journey couldn't have been better. Yeah, it sounds like the perfect opportunity for you to end up at GitLab. And I know a lot of people in our audience are probably here because they aspire to the same. Um, so can you tell us a little more, especially for the people here who may someday apply to work at GitLab, what is the application process like? Like, Where do, where do people start and wh where do they end up? How, at what point in the process do you usually connect with your candidates and what does yeah. it look like? Yeah. So what I think is very unique uh, is one of our, we, at GitLab, we are trying to live very close to our values. And one of those values is, is transparency. And so all that you have at GitLab in the interviewing process is in our handbook. So we, uh, our company is basically living by the handbook, which is constantly updated and fed by the, uh, the team and also even the community. And what we have there is really every tiny step that you will need to take during the interviewing process, which makes it so, so nice as a candidate because it reduces your surprise level. And um, um, I have a, a very strong objective during interviewing. I'm, I, I always try to tell people, I know it's not possible to 100%, but I want to reduce the stress level of people. This is already a super stressy situation, especially perhaps even on top of the remote. But by have, I want to have a dialogue. I think it's very important for me to see the person not when they are completely stressed out, but rather when they are closer to what they are normally in, a, in their perception and how they are answer questions, etc. And that is why we are trying to smooth this also out during the interviewing process of I have a little trick of asking simply a question that I have seen in the CV that perhaps I have some connections to, perhaps I have a team member in that country or that city, or I'm looking forward to hear more about a certain thing in the CV. And topics like that really smooth it out. It sounds cheesy at the beginning, but to some extent it gives already a much nicer um, atmosphere simply. And that's where I want to go to because I don't see an interview as just me asking questions and then picking one person. I want to have a candidate that in reality is super motivated for their job, is super motivated for that company, for that team. And what do they need for that? They need to know also how we work, who we are, what we believe in, and um, where we want to go also in six months, 12 months. Um, and I think this is choosing a job is not the, the, it's 50% for us choosing the candidate, but for the other side, it should be also choosing the job that you want to stay in for the next X months, years to come. Uh, because we are investing a lot in the hiring process, we are investing a lot in people, and we want to build teams. And I think this is a, a very important step in the whole process. What we normally have um, is that we have a, 
uh, multiple levels during the interviewing. So for, for example, for an engineering role, you would be uh, have a screening call. Uh, this means that one of our recruiters is doing a basic call. And for example, there you will find all the topics that the, the recruiter will discuss with you in this call already in the handbook. So it's not about you. Well, there's a surprise question coming out of the box. It's really getting to know that person and seeing if they are fit for the role and for the team and for GitLab, etc. And then depending on what type of role it is, you would come then also to a, a technical interview call where it's really about solving a technical problem and, and figuring something out together, which we are trying rather not to target off the classic whiteboard test, but rather target on an actual example of something to debug. So reading through codes, doing a code review, stuff that you would do really on your daily job. And then you get to your hiring manager, um, so the, the, the manager of the team. And if you pass that level, then you basically would get to me as the director of engineering for the whole sub department and having the final interview. Then we are doing also on top of that a reference check and background check. Normally the, the interviews, take around an hour, um, can sometimes even take one and a half hours. I don't want, we want to stick to the time. And that is also one part that people can stick to time. But on the other hand, we also don't want to fully rush it or so when you're in a conversation. And so if you are able to get through all those levels, um, then you would be basically uh, get to an offer stage. And then we most probably would make an offer to the candidate that we are looking for. So how many interviews is this overall? You have your um, technical work normally this means four levels uh, four interviews it sometimes can happen and that's why it totally depends i would say engineering managers are very quite connected on the different roles that are open or last year right now we are in a situation where we are very fully staffed in the sub department and we are staying at that number of 90 people at the moment uh, but if i have a multiple um, opportunities I or my remote, uh, my engineering managers already know, hey, there is another role. That's why I also want to get to know the person as much as possible in the sense of tell me more about your interests, because perhaps I have a complete different role in another team that that person hasn't seen. And this happened uh, quite some times uh, where I think this person might be a better fit. And then we would also add, for example, another hiring manager interview, which is then less of an interview, but more of like a get to know each other because we see that this person is a better fit for another team. This, that I have a lot of analogies from football because I'm a huge football fan for you, it's soccer in the US, but I'm hiring for a team, which means that I'm hiring not 11 goalkeepers, I'm hiring that I have a, a wide stretch of technical abilities from different levels, but also social skills and soft skills. Uh, in the sense that the team can get together and they can benefit from each other. So this means I want to hear uh, the, the things that you can do very well, but also the things that you might not do that well, but want to learn, for example. And then I know, okay, there is someone that this person could match up, etc. And that's then the nice thing that you can do if you have a couple of roles open uh, to really find the perfect fit for that exact uh, person. So. Yeah, like it's not just about the individual, but how everyone fits together, it sounds like. So that I think that's a good reminder to people who might be feeling discouraged with like rejection right now, because it's also a bit of luck of being at the right place at the right time. And perhaps you're the goalkeeper and you also applied at the same time just by bad luck as 10 other goalkeepers. So that's a good reminder. Um, so now diving a little deeper into your, inter into your interview process, what are your favorite interview questions to ask candidates? And what kind of answers would you expect from a candidate that you might end up hiring? Good question. And I will, um, I mean, they are not as secret, so I'm more than happy to, to, to share them as they are just questions and I, I'm listening for the answer. Um, I think a very important thing coming back to the whole dialogue topic is really in the sense of what I'm also expecting as a hiring manager, especially I'm basically at stage number four. I'm the fourth interview that you're having. So in this sense, and the people know that this is the last level, so people should already know, okay, this is getting real. And what I'm expecting to some extent is that the people that are applying have actually 
prepared for that role. So they know what role they have applied for and they know what we are doing. They know where we are going and stuff like that as they have taught. And that's what all the great candidates do. But there, there are also a lot of candidates who don't prepare at all. And that's what, what I think everyone can do their homework to, to increase their chances, simply prepare, figure out what this company is really doing. Um, we have a huge advantage, which is we are open source. This means people can simply pick up even an issue and fix it and and and, and debug it. We had we have a lot of people that we have taken out of the community or that have shown already that community contributions uh, coming to us. And I think that's exactly what what we are expecting also to some extent. Coming back to you, you want to work here. This is your main life focus for the next years. Uh, so investing simply a little bit of time and, and getting to know if this is really the thing definitely helps. And that is getting back to my first question is if, if I know that people have some experience with GitLab, our product, then my main question is I give you a month free of work. You can do whatever you want. You have all the technical skills that you need, completely setting them aside. What is something that you are annoyed by our software? What is something that you would improve, that you would change? You have one month that you can do whatever you want. And that gives me also a good insight of the people who have really just looked at it for two minutes or who have already some experience or even have looked at it and, and, and tried it out. Because what I make that's the that's a huge advantage for me in this role is I'm hiring people for who are also my main customers. They are using the product every day. I'm using our product. 80 to 90 percent of the day which is something that you don't have in a lot of of those jobs so i think there it should be even less of a problem of preparing yourself for the, the role um another good question that i'd like to ask is last thing that you debugged uh, because there i get much more insight of how much people are actually involved in what they're doing i have seen so many times and that is my pro tip for people of standing out with their cvs is write what you have built at that company. Don't write company X, Y, Z from to then software engineering level 7.5. This doesn't tell me anything. I want to see, for example, have you built the checkout process or have you solved a very specific problem to the software that gives me much more insight. What part have you played in, in that role? And that's also what I, where I'm trying to get with that question is, how much is this person involved? And another big thing that I'm most of the time doing on that level is I'm trying to also figure out how senior that person is. Where do we rank them? Which is a very hard thing. In reality, you have four hours that you're looking at a person and then you need to figure out where do they fit into our roles with intermediate, senior, staff, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, that's one question. And my most favorite question, I always say that's my most favorite. What, what are your questions? And that is, again, coming back to the preparation part is, I'm expecting that you must have some sort of question. There must be something that you want to know, even if it's just, um, what will you do in six to 12 months at GitLab? What is, what's the target of the project? What's the vision? But that can be also very easy things of how do people connect socially? Uh, there can be tons of questions coming, especially out of all the interviews beforehand. And I think that tells me a lot uh, and I'm, um, tells me a lot, but I can also give a lot back to the person. And to be honest, I mean, this is a very, very high market with where the companies are not just sitting there and saying, yeah, I will hire whoever comes. And no, we are looking for the best talent, but the best talent normally has also some other offers. They have some other companies that are interested. So I'm also trying to give them a better understanding what they would be getting into, what they will be getting into in their daily job, but what are also some things that they can do in one year, two years, three years at this company. And um, that's why I'm asking, what are your questions? Yeah, so I, I think you were talking a little bit about um, the seniority and engaging people's skill level. And I want to jump back to that because I know I'm sure there are a lot of people in our audience who are just starting out um, in their careers. So straight out of boot camp or university. 
I, and, and they might be wondering like, when could I actually be eligible to land a job at GitLab? Um, and I'm curious, what, what are, do you hire <laughs> interns or junior developers or do you mostly hire people who are more senior? We hire uh, at the moment only starting with intermediate um, for the main roles, but we have, we had the first round of um, an internship um, because we said when we are doing an internship um, remotely, which is something that not a lot of companies have done before, we want to do it right. And I think we had really great success. I have currently two, two, two new team members that we have hired into full roles in April, I believe. Time flies this year. Um, but we hired them straight away out of the internship program. Uh, they have shown really great energy, great taking part in the product, and we are very happy about that. Um, so we are definitely targeting another internship program. Um, so this is something um, to apply for that one. And for example, there, apply for it, learn from the interview process. There we also had a very intensive interview process because you learn out of it. And sometimes I believe that a lot of, especially on that level of junior intermediate, they believe, okay, this is a company that's working remotely all across the world. No, we are just a company that is looking for great talent. And this doesn't mean in the first place we are not expecting as a junior or an intern that you already know everything. We want to get you to a level that um, you become on a technical level or also that good, but we want to see some specific things like this energy and and, and, and the, uh, the hunger for, for building a great product. And um, so I, I think that's a huge part. The other big part that we have seen and that is a, a huge topic for us as we are open source, we have thousands of contributors to our software. Contribute, start contributing. We have uh, community contributions, we have hackathons, we are giving out swag every quarter for the best uh, uh, contributors. And this can give you a lot of presence for our team. Um, so for example, we I think we have hired four or five people at least in the last couple of years, just in my sub department from that community. So um, if you want to connect to us, if you want to figure out what we are doing, then I think this is the best way. That's, that's perfect kind of lead into my next question that aside from just um, the straight up technical skills that you write on your resume, um, what else What else are you looking for in a candidate? When you're considering a remote engineering candidate, what is something, what's the best thing they can do to really stand out from the crowd? As I know you get a ton of applicants at GitLab, what, what, what makes the people that stand out, what makes them special? And how can our audience take this into account when planning out how to prepare for, for applying for a job there? Yeah, uh, good question. One thing that I said before is, is really that create some better descriptions around what you have actually done at that, uh, that job, at that company. Sometimes those companies don't tell me anything. They could be huge in the US and I have no idea about it, but sometimes they can be also huge names and then there is level X, Y, Z. Also doesn't tell me. Tell us just in a couple of bullet points what you have built at the company, what you have learned at that company. Have you grown from intermediate to senior? Have you done something specifically where you're part of the scaling team? Um, those are the things that I'm looking for in a, uh, in a CV. And, to stand out there, add some side projects, add something interesting. I, 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 that's also where I'm coming from is simply, I want to build products. I'm doing engineering and I think that's, that's a huge advantage over a lot of other jobs is you can do, especially by today with all the open source stuff and everything that is available, you can just go out and build something. It can be, it doesn't need to be something new or it doesn't need to be a startup, it can be your side project that you're proud of. It can be something to help your family organize. It can be art. I've seen a couple of, uh, I have especially one engineer we hired who stood out simply with her art um, and stuff like that. Um, or we have one engineer, uh, she is having a huge Instagram channel where she's basically posting every week tips around coding. She started as an intermediate, but she really wanted to get into the, the technical things over the last years. And she said, look, 
that's the stuff that I learned. And I'm pretty sure there will be other people also out there that can learn from what I'm doing. And that's what I want to see. I want to see what stuff people have built. Talks, also a huge topic. People that are teaching other people, etc., cetera. Um, and uh, helping there is definitely a, a topic. Uh, so um, I think that's something people can stand out during that part. During the interviews, I think it's really, again, tell us a little bit about what you're interested in. Tell us a little bit about what you, where you want to go, something that you want to learn or something that you have a background in um, that is perhaps three jobs ago. But we are always looking also for this asset. We are looking for specific positions um, in the sense of, OK, what can we add to the team? And I'm not talking about any culture ad or anything, just like something that the team is currently perhaps missing. And um, yeah, and the more we know, the better it is. Yeah, it sounds like great to just be open and share share your story as much as well as much and as well as you can and practice that. I think it would be a good tip just to everyone if you if you feel like you're struggling explaining your past jobs or something, just practice it with a friend. Get your friend to make your friend sit down, buy them a coffee virtually, I guess, at this point in time, and uh, give it a go. Practice. So another thing you've mentioned to me about um, GitLab is that you put a big emphasis on. Um, everyone being a manager of one and that's really tied in i think not just gitlab but any remote job um that being able to manage yourself in your own time is really important so i'm curious to ask you personally how you structure your day to reach maximum productivity now especially now during the pandemic i know you have multiple children you've been in lockdown you've all you've all been in the same house while you're supposed to get your your work done at the same time and i wonder if you have any good tips about how you how you get it all done Good tips. That, that's a really tough question. Um, what I'm trying to explain to people who just got now into remote due to the pandemic is really this is not remote work in, in the essence of what we are used to because it's a very hard and it's a very different situation. Um, and uh, it, it is very different across the world. And, and, and uh, to me, for me personally, for example, I'm, I, I feel very fortunate to have this job at GitLab to have a company that I'm working that is um, doing great stuff. And, and I, I definitely looking out at people who are sitting in small apartments and don't have a job anymore. So for that part, I'm simply fortunate by having that possibility at the moment. Um, and um, great tips of getting through this is really find your own rhythm. And a huge thing, and this is, this is where I always said it's very hard to write your values on some papers, some marketing papers, or even some wall uh, posters. But it's really the hard part is living by your values. And I'm still surprised um, how the company and especially our CEO is living those values. We are having, for example, a Family and Friends Day. By now, we have it every month. So this is like an additional public holiday on top of everything. We have already unlimited uh, holiday, but we said, and what we saw especially is during the pandemic, it's very hard for people to understand. You can stay at home, but still take off. Um, the staycation is the new buzzword, but so people were working for us too many hours or we're not taking PTO. So we said, look, that's, we want to have, we have in our values, family and friends first. Normally this means if there's something with your family, if there's something with your friends, you drop everything, you go out there and you take care of it. And we see this quite the same is uh, that we have created this public holiday. We close the company. No one has the feeling, oh, I need to be on or I, I'm at home. I should work. Um, so we have a dedicated day. This worked so well that we, I think we have now, the, we had the sixth last week. We have the seventh this month. Uh, so, um, this really helps. Um, and also for me, uh, that's the really the, the, the fortunate part in the sense of I, I simply reduced my hours and I'm, I'm we are trying to live by those values also as, as senior leadership, simply in the sense of I'm making everyone aware, hey, look, I'm in full lockdown. I need to figure out how this is working. And I have my two kids at home, kindergarten is closed. I'm reducing my hours to 50, 60%. Uh, or I will make them more flexible. And we are trying to 
emphasize this also with all our team members to take enough time off uh, during this time. And I think that's the main help that we can give as a company. And that's the biggest tip is to, if you're not able to get this at your company, talk to them. This is a super stressful time and people being at home with kids or, or other topics is increasing the stress level by X. And if a company is able to relieve the stress, your employees or your team members will be 10 times more productive. And this is going back also to the, we are counting results and not time. And it's so much more efficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that work-life balance and also just the reminding reminding yourself to go easy on yourself right now for in your current role or if you're job seeking and feeling just really burnt out, just remember this. I mean, this just sucks for everyone right now, some more than others, but you just, everyone's stress level is high. So I think we can all go easy on ourselves, try to do our best with work-life balance and and just know that we'll, we'll get through it and have more productive and better times in the future too. Um, so diving into our next bit, a couple hot takes here. Can you list the three key soft skills to land a remote engineering job? Async communication, that is something not a lot of people are used to. Um, why? Because this is the door opener. I mean, we can't neglect time zones at GitLab, but um, we need to work around them. And it works much better than I would have ever expected. So my team really at the moment is California to New Zealand. That's the range that we have in my sub department, which means almost all the time zones. Um, and the only thing how you can do this is working through async communication. Uh, so by documenting, by writing stuff down, by recording stuff, by record all your calls that are more than two people. This makes it so much easier and so much more inclusive for people who are in APEC time zone, etc. cetera, um, to still be part of it. You can be even in a meeting, ask a question and simply write on the agenda, look, I'm not here, but anyone else verbalize for it. Have an agenda for the meeting. Have write down everything in the agenda as much as possible because this can be increased the, 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 the time you simply look at the agenda of a bigger meeting. Um, other, other super trick is if you have a recorded meeting, you can watch it even by two times. So that you can have a meeting of 30 minutes and 15 minutes and can rewatch it. And all those different parts and really also using our own software for documenting, having issues, having workflows uh, that really embrace those parts and not be like, look, I need this this second. No, the world will not go down if this is done now or in the next hour, as long as it's not a production incident for that is, that is a different story. But we are living with this. And by now we have such a big team that we are even able to do 24 hours handovers which is an awesome thing. So if you are having a problem of production incident, I'm so proud of my team that the first person starts in the Philippines, finds the problem, they start investigating, they hand it over to someone in Europe, they start building the fix for it, they will hand it over for finalizing the fix in the US, in the East Coast, um, and then basically someone in the West Coast gets this to production. And this is, uh, um, is, is really a huge thing, which is then the sync communication, but this is only possible due to the big async communication. So this is a huge skill and this is very underused. I mean, you know it from your classic uh, office uh, jobs. Documenting is at the absolute end of it, of your list. Um, but through the async communication, and you can take a look at our handbook, I think it's 3,000, 4,000 pages by now, but you find every process that we have. You find our strategy roadmap for the next years. You can find how to reimburse expenses for headphones in there. Everything is there. And that enables everyone in the process to work completely async. They don't need to sit and wait until person X comes around and ask them a question of expenses. Yes, sometimes this might also happen, but as soon as we have an answer for that, someone will go ahead and create a merge request and get this into our handbook. So the next person that comes along can look it up in the handbook and find this information. And all these enablers, I think those make the big difference between just working remotely, everyone sitting somewhere and connecting for Zoom to having a really well-oiled company. 
And getting there is not as easy as it sounds, especially with the async stuff, because people tend to be, I want my answer, I want to my answer, I ping three people. Not the best idea in the first place, if it's not um, out of the way. The other thing that you mentioned is really a manager of one, which is not just about organization. It's not about organizing yourself and your day and your rhythm. And that's where also the remote job and the flexibility of it comes into play because I believe people are very different in their rhythm. There can be people who love to go out and run for two hours in the morning and they have the flexibility to be in this work zone and there will be others who don't feel it. And in the end, an engineering job especially, I'm not talking about managers, but an engineering job is a very creative job. So this means you need to be in the zone in simply the sense of you need to feel it because I believe that if you have this feeling of it works, in one hour of that, you are 10 times more productive than sitting around in your office in your chair for six hours and having no idea uh, how to get to it and being, but just go out, play with the kids, run, watch a film, take a nap. Uh, so uh, those are all things to get you better in the zone again, to be much more productive in the other three hours um, and, and getting there is is also part of this manager of one, which is also something, and this is again, the remote world is not all golden and shiny. You need to be aware that there are differences, social connecting, uh, not having the feeling that you're just one person completely lost. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, topics that people can struggle with, and it's really up to you to find your rhythm and find your connections with other people to really um, uh, figure that out. Um, soft skill number three that I would advise. Mm -hmm. No, nothing comes to my mind right now. <laughs> I think there, there were a couple of more in, in, included in the first two, so yeah. <laughs> Those, I feel like they're pretty broad. They're, they're really solid. The async communication I, that involves yeah. many skills, especially writ, writing and and then being a manager of one. That's I think that's something there's probably a learning curve when people first go remote. But once you figure out your rhythm, the flexibility of remote work can be amazing. I know that personally, um, especially with a creative job as well. So moving forward, what would be your number one tip for remote engineering job seekers? But not too obvious, not what everyone else is saying. So what's your number one non-obvious tip for remote engineering job seekers? To to get one or to have one? <laughs> so, I think to get one. But if you have a tip for having one, that's good to you. Be honest in the reflection to yourself why you're looking for the remote job in the first place. This is normally number four of my most favorite questions why are you looking for a remote job? What do you believe are your personal advantages or disadvantages? And that's coming back to, I, I, I have sometimes the fear that this can be way too buzzworthy of like, hey, I need to work remote, I can do whatever I want. No, in the end, it's still a job and you need to figure out how to work in a job. And there are things that people can very easily struggle with and you need to be aware of them and be able to self-reflect beforehand to know if remote is really a thing for you. And um, that's what we are also trying to poke in during the interview is, especially if you haven't had a remote job before, uh, but also even, even if you had one, uh, is what do you think will be the most, uh, the nicest thing about the job and what will be the hardest thing for you? Will it be really adapting to an async? Will it be adapting to, because you have four kids at home that you are homeschooling to find a room? Uh, and, and how do you want to mitigate those things? I think that that's the, that's the number one tip that I would give everyone, especially going remote, is first really be honest to yourself. Why are you looking for that job? And I know some people that, that, that are really love sitting around in, in an office for hours and have a chat and have these brainstorms. The thing is, there is, you can do the same thing in, in, in remote, but it's different and you need to connect differently to people. And um, to some extent, we are also 
I mean, 2020 is unfortunately very, very different, but what we are trying to have, normally we have also travel grants uh, and we have, so people who are visiting other Git levels get basically uh, travel costs reimbursed. And I had so many uh, visitors from all around the world here in Vienna. And, um, and, and this is a super exciting thing. We had a contribute, so we met once a year or every 11 months uh, in one place. And that were also always great times. I always said it's it's like kerosene for um, building your relationships uh, and, and getting to know other people because you have one week where you're doing stuff together. It's really not about work. It's really about getting to know people. And now we even need to figure that out more we have team uh, pizza evenings we have a game night for different areas in the product that are not just engineering but everyone that is working on the product in that area they are doing among us and uh, draw sorrows and stuff like that so you need to be creative also on the on the material side or on the, on the social side to to connect people because it shouldn't be the case that we have 20 people who are sitting at home and submitting their work it should be still we want to create a team because a team at the end is still 20 times better than just 10 individuals so um, that's what we are trying to get to and that is something you need to reflect for yourself if this is the thing and how you want to get there and yeah it said so those uh, that are in our audience who do want this and want to get there what can they do now to optimize their their CV or online presence for their remote job search. Do you have any specific tips for for that? Mm, CV, just start with a well-formatted CV that is readable and easy to read. And uh, I have seen so many CVs that we're not even we were not even able to open, or it's very hard to read. It's not about the amount of information. It's really about that we get key takeaways, what you are looking for, what you have done in the past. What have, and that's again, preparing for the job that you're applying for sometimes is a much more better investment for one or five jobs that you want that you're applying for than just mass sending. I have also seen a lot of cover letters that were for different companies that came to me. <laughs> oh, no. uh, that's, that's, I think, the preparation and simply pointing out in a good cover letter or the CV what are things that we are looking for that 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 are fitting. So, have you worked on a on a developer product? Have you worked with something at scale? Because we have millions of users. So, uh, those points, adding them in on the CV, I think that's it's not about the design or rather invest in your content and and really. We don't have time to read nine pages of CV. That's also clear. So rather get to the point, make everything, uh, uh, put everything in there that you believe is really important and what you're really proud of. Um, that is also one of the questions. Is uh, coming back to the you can build stuff in that job. So if you have a side project, put it in there. If you have something which is yeah, I wrote a Raspberry Pi, blah blah blah, put it in there because it's interesting to us and we are looking for people who are really creative um, uh, building a product. So figure that out, uh, what you need in their CV and also create an online presence. I mean, if you're working as an engineer for a web application, especially for example, front end engineer, there shouldn't be not too much that stops you from just building something that is interesting and um, it doesn't need to be as we have one of our engineers who is also a great illustrator at the same time, who is building perfectly organized and super illustrated online comics for applying. Doesn't need to be that much, but yeah, main information and we are already very happy. Yeah, so what, 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 what should go on someone's checklist? I know they that people want to like tailor their cv to specific jobs and really research the company so if someone here is thinking of applying to gitlab or any other company right now what do you think what should be on their list of items that they must do before they apply to make sure they know what they're doing and are ready take a look at the jobs that we offer um, right now what we have in place we are trying something new at the moment with a talent community you can apply for that that's even better to show what you know of because then we are looking we have a pool because as said for example my uh, sub department at the moment is 99 percent staffed but as soon as we are hiring again 
we will take them from this pool or and there are continuously also uh, jobs open in my area or other engineering areas so i think simply applying for that part and um on the other hand open source work is always something that makes you visible um, in the community and also to us um, but then picking out something that you are really interested in and really can connect to and not just oh engineer back end ba boom and 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 going back again to rather invest more time in a couple of applications um, than doing hundreds and they are just super widespread. Yeah, so it sounds like for GitLab especially, if you apply to GitLab and you don't look at the handbook, you're pretty much doomed to fail. <laughs> so that's a like first step for sure for, for your company or any company that has similar information out there. Read that whole thing. Or I don't know, how long is the handbook? Do you think people should read it from word to word from beginning to end? Uh, that's the first thing I give everyone who is starting a job then at GitLab is don't read the thing, it's a handbook, it's something, there are a lot of parts that are worth reading around values and your team, but there is also a lot of parts that are just for looking at, <laughs> so you can, it's really a thousand page of pages, so, um, uh, but yeah, um, I think. Pick out something. Thing and, and. Yeah. And the handbook is giving you all the information, even about how you should apply and what should be in there and, and all those things. And it's just, it's one Google search away. Uh, it's very clear pages. And I, will, I, uh, I think we will also give the, the links at a later point in an overview to the community. But it's really GitLab interview, hiring, handbook, off you go. And it shouldn't be too hard. Perfect. So. Anything else you'd like to add before we dive into Q and A? No, looking forward to to questions. Yeah, let's see, we got a lot of messages in the chat. It'll take me, bear with me as I filter through. I think a reminder for for the rest of the event is there's also the event tab for the chat for everyone. So if you have um, anything related to the talk, you can put in the stage chat, and anything else can go in the event chat. It's helpful for us when we're going through the questions too. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We have a first question from Tina. Just curious if you found a great candidate that fits your team values but didn't fit in a role, how do you handle those cases? I think you, you covered that one. Um, like you do keep them, you hang on to their information in case something else comes up, right? Yes. And we have hired, a, I, uh, I personally hired a couple of them um, where we thought that the technical skills were not up to that point what we were looking for. We had um, one person that we actually told we just are looking for a little bit more of this experience. They did exactly that, learned it. Uh, six, eight months later, they came back to us and told us, look, I have learned a lot in that area. I would be more than happy to interview again. And this person is now working here. Um, and we are trying, especially if we see a candidate where we see a lot of potential, but just one thing is missing, or what you have said is also 100% true. You need also a lot of timing and luck in the whole process in the end. It could be that you saw the job ad two weeks too late. There were already so many people in, in, the, in the process, and there are really hundreds of applicants uh, sometimes for, for different jobs uh, that we get in a week. So it's it's really we are trying to see if we see a candidate that we see a lot of potential and i'm talking also to my ems and they are like oh my god i have three perfect candidates but i only can hire one and then we are really looking forward to keep them in the list and we have hired a lot of them over time so uh, this is nothing that should stop you now and we're trying to give also starting with the technical interview we are trying also to give as much feedback as possible from that side so that people can take this as a key takeaway and come back also after a certain time and, and reapply or, or yeah get into the hire again. That's awesome. I'm sure that's really helpful for everyone to actually, it's, it's rare to get feedback from your interviewer. I think that's really important. Um, so next up, we have a lot of people interested in this question. Do you have any insight on how to obtain a remote position straight out of coding bootcamp? That, that's a really tough one uh, because I think that what we also struggled with is internships on in remote are very complex because they are very new. There are not too many companies who are like full, fully remote. 
especially before this year. I mean, right now, this is a little bit of a different story, but especially last year, it was very new. And we said, if we are going to do an internship program, we want to do this right, because I have seen tons of internship programs which are not worth the term, or that there are people then who are sorting yeah, uh, letters or something like that in an office. And we want to have something where they can integrate into the team, they get actual tasks, they are part like a full engineer, they can learn something from it, and we can see how they progress and hopefully get to hire them. Um, I think that's also the, the best part, but that's also, I said, it's a very new thing, so the, 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 the spots are limited. Um, as far as I know, we want to do it again. Um, I know that a couple of other companies have even reached out to us to see how we did it. Um, but um, we will see how the, the, the next month's progresses. I hope that there are more opportunities like that. Um, the other part, again, we have the um, community contribution stuff. Um, you can take part of it, uh, can learn something from it. We have a dedicated team. All our teams, engineering teams, are also helping. Uh, people get their stuff merged, and that's a nice start. And it's a nice start to to get to. So um, that's the best tip that I could give in that sense. Yeah, I know it's not easy to get a junior role or an internship remotely. I think um, I read that I think it's about six only six percent of job posting developer job postings are for junior roles, um, remote postings. And but actually, our company Arc we created a job search tool, and I'm going to post in the chat right now where you can search for junior developer jobs and internships and filter by experience level, tech stack, and also company size. So um, those of you who are interested in that, I recommend you check that out. Let's see, moving forward here, um, a question from Ani. How does one get a start in tech where there are hardly any, uh, well, th that might be similar question, but she says, she or he says, is a CS degree or boot camp certification necessary in this day and age? Is networking the only way to get an application seen by another human? No, I think, for example, the, the, the person that we have hired um, that I mentioned before with the Instagram channel, uh, she she doesn't have a CS degree. She came basically from a different job family, I forgot which one, but she said, I want to get into tech and I learn all everything as, as much as I can and try to progress. And she was so impressive with that part of, on one hand, what she had already learned and on the other hand, also taking what she learned and providing that to the community through her Instagram channel and her talks, etc. because she believes strongly that everyone should give them, be given that opportunity. Um, and, and, and that was simply super impressive. And uh, that's again, I, I think, yes, you can have a CS degree. Yes, you can have a bootcamp uh, degree, but you can also stand out again and, and try to build stuff, try to, to learn uh, all the time. Uh, um, I think that's, the, 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 yeah, having this, the, the, this, this skill set that you are, have been given, there's constantly stuff to learn and that is super easy to learn. There are so many job, jobs out there where you will find zero information on the internet um, and you just have the opportunity to learn this job on the job to get a job. And in engineering, in reality, by now, when I started, there was just 10 books, uh, but by now there are, there's the internet and you, you, you have so many free tools and uh, free um, information and knowledge bases that can help you learn so much stuff um, that I believe that this shouldn't, this is a hurdle, but it's, it's, you can overcome it uh, to some extent. So, Based on what you said today, there are a lot of different ways to show your skills that are more than just a piece of paper that says you studied something and maybe even better ways like your side projects, contributing and just getting out there on online, sharing what you know. And, and yeah, there are a lot of great ways to show that, especially with the internet and everything we've got now. Um, let's see, next question from Trin. Sorry if I'm butchering people's names at all. Um, they say, hi, is there any position currently open for Golang or Python developers at GitLab? Yes, uh, please take a look at the aboutgitlab.com jobs careers page that someone already posted in the chat and take a look at there. Um, yes, we are. We, we have Golang teams and sometimes we're also hiring for them. Uh, but the, the best part is uh, become part of our um, 
a pool for a, a hiring. You can apply for that at any time. And then you basically are in a list of uh, interesting candidates. And as soon as something comes up, we will um, reach out in that sense. So I'll just keep going in there and refreshing that page and, and hopefully you'll find the thing that's right for you then. Um, we have our next question. This is a great question. Does GitLab hire candidates that have intellectual or learning disabilities? And um, does, is the hiring process different? How does it work for that? And if you have any tips, that would be helpful. Yes. Uh, so one of, of, of the main targets that we are trying to do is also create a really inclusive hiring process. And um, the hard thing is to, as you are not all openly asking questions or to knowing how to accommodate a position. So if you take a look at our handbook, I think it's even on the main interview page, there is a section around how we can accommodate um, your uh, disabilities. Uh, we, we, By the way, we have, uh, for example, for interviews, we have even a reimbursement list. So if you need, for example, um, a translation for uh, if you have a hearing disability, then we will reimburse it. If you need an office, if you need internet, if you need a laptop, we will reimburse those topics if you are in, on the interviewing level. Um, and there is also a section where you can write us to please let us know how we can best accommodate and make the, the, the interview process as inclusive as possible um, to uh, I think interviews at gitlab.com uh, is also the email address that you can write us, give us feedback, uh, or let us know beforehand. And then we will try our best to make this as inclusive and as best as possible during the interview. That's great. I love how you're always open to new, new information, too, and changing things up um, as needed. Next question, how, is GitLab, how does GitLab evaluate the English level of candidates? Uh, for talking, I mean, we have tons of non-native speakers. Uh, differs a little bit um, on, on, on each role, how much we are looking for it. Of course, if you are a manager and you need to communicate a lot, um, um, then uh, English is perhaps even a little bit more important. We also offer courses and training uh, if we see potential in the candidate, but we see that there is a, a, a something that is missing. Um, but yeah, of course, at the end, uh, we are still talking to people. That's part of the interview is, is there a common understanding? And I had uh, sometimes interviews where I knew, okay, only 10% of my questions were understood completely. Some, some of that stuff is also back to the fact that I'm a non-native speaker, uh, but um, yeah, you need to have a, a certain level simply to understand everyone, uh, but it's, it's not as high as you need to have English level certificate, blah, 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 uh, in that sense. But uh, also what makes it sometimes easier is the async stuff, especially for people where the English is not as good. They have much more time in the async way because they can sit down, they can write, and they can get help from Grammarly or other tools uh, on, on top of that. So that definitely helps, but a certain level should be there. Yeah, Grammarly is a great tool for anyone, especially if you're writing your, your um, job applications or emailing people. You can, I think it's like a Chrome extension you can add that just checks not just the spelling, but the grammar in your in your writing, which it's, it's great to use because even I, native speaker, miss things sometimes. Um, so I have another couple of questions. I'm going to combine them, actually, is so first is is do you use an ATS? Um, is ATS the blocker that fil filters out applications that don't contain the right keywords? And also, how do you even get a job application seen by another human among hundreds to thousands of other applications? Uh, what stands ATS for? <laughs> I personally do not know, but I guess um, mm -hmm. I know some companies use like systems that just auto filter resumes if like if they're missing certain aspects. Uh, uh, I think we just do form checks, but apart from that, afterwards we are looking. I have looked at so many CVs, uh, and and sometimes um, if we are, for example, if we were looking for a, a very important hire, I was sitting and looking at three hundred resumes um, to pick out the ones that we want to express and and that we want to have as soon as possible in front of us, um, and. Um, 
No, normally I think everything on our side is screened by people. Um, uh, there are some certain minimum things if you have actually submitted a CV and if you have filled out all the fields. But apart from that, as far as I know, um, it's all screened by, by humans. Nice. Yeah, it's it's hard. Those those things are imperfect, of course. So when you don't have humans in the process, I know it's it's uh, gets complicated. Um, and another question: Do you hire entrepreneurs or ex startup founders at GitLab? Uh, sorry, which question was that? So do you hire? I jumped down there. Are quite a few messages here. Do you hire entrepreneurs or ex startup founders at GitLab? We have uh, some sort of alliances. Um, so we have um, most of the startup founders, uh, we have hired a couple of them, but they simply apply to an engineering role. And we have made some acquisitions in the past. Um, so we have some entrepreneurs and former CEOs that we basically hired with their assets. Um, but apart from that, we also have some people. I have done also a couple of startups in my past and uh, and yeah, it, it's a huge and, and really great skill because you you understand a little bit more um, how to interact faster on different changes and, and, and be adaptive and especially scaling is a huge topic in, 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 in startups, which is one of the main skills that we were looking for, especially last year, because it's, it's a huge difference if you just hire one person a year or if you hire 60 people for 30 people. You need to build processes while you're hiring and not just the hiring is the first step, but then you need to figure out how does your team work, how does your organization work with that more people. Um, and you need to be aware that you need to constantly adapt. Five people is a completely different game than 10 people. And sometimes even seven people can be already very different. That's what where, where we were looking, especially for aging managers, who already have that sort of experience um, in building those teams, in building, injecting those processes with not over processing, but figuring out the right structures in place. And uh, yeah. So jumping back a little bit, I realize I missed a question. I'll combine it with another one that was added on to that. Um, so the question is, if a candidate has a long gap from last employment, how does it affect their hiring chances? Um, and if it does, how long of a gap is considered bad? And then adding to that, if there was a gap due to something more taboo, like anxiety or depression, do you think it's okay to be honest about that? And how would you recommend approaching it? Be as transparent as possible with us. Um, I know this is this can be a very tough topic, um, but that to be honest, um, I think uh, for us it it is definitely something okay what happened there. Uh, but I believe, especially uh, with people out getting kids, etc., this is a quite normal thing. Um, so simply provide an explanation. Uh, as transparent as you want to share with us. Um, that's that's my advice there. Um, and then I believe we are very open. Uh, we just need to understand to some extent what 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 happened there, what was going on. Um, and and yeah, we have hired some people who also said, I want to have a gap year. I couldn't stand my job anymore, and now I want to get back to it. Um, yeah, there can be life plays a lot of different stories. Um, so I think as long as we get it, then we are, if there is like a lot of yellow flags or a lot of holes and that we don't understand, yes, it gets harder for us. Um, so be transparent as much as you can. That's great advice. And I also think if anyone has gaps in their resume this year, <laughs> don't even worry about it. I'm sure every sane hiring manager out there won't even think twice about the pandemic gap year. Uh, although, unfortunately, you weren't traveling the world and having a grand old time <laughs> while, you, while you have your um, I think we have one last question. Let's see. This um, question from a mid-career changer. How do you consider years of professional experience alongside a person's technical skills? For example, um, I just completed a data science boot camp, but have years of experience in a few disciplines. It's, a, it's always a mix. Um, it's it's it, it's a mix of finding out the seniority it depends on what role you apply for. Um, it depends on what we are looking for um, and how long you're in there. Uh, 
if you just did a data science course, uh, I think you, you need to be uh, aware that you most probably start as an intermediate in that role, but can show us to us that you are much better already in that field with all your pre-experience. And, and that's, again, coming back share as much as you can, also outside of, of other activities or things. Um, we have some engineers who have been UX designers before. We have some UX designers who have been engineers before. I have uh, backend engineers who have been support engineers. So I think this combination is can be a huge add to the team again. So if you have, for example, worked a couple of years in support, this makes you a fantastic person of understanding what customers are looking for, what customers' problems are out there, what, what, what they are looking for. Um, so this is a huge add for the team. And this can be the same for this specific example if this person just has for example, other uh, experience in uh, scaling software in databases, yeah, then databases plus data engineering is already two pluses in the book. Uh, so I think this definitely shouldn't stop you. And, and again, try it out. If, if, if it's a no, then perhaps pick up your skills a little bit more on, on the data engineering and try it again in a couple of more months. But the don't feel disencouraged just by the description of the job. Um, this can also change, that can be not everything in there. Uh, we are trying our best, but other jobs that I've seen. So give it a try and, and don't be demotivated if you're not taken right away or if you're not directly invited. And yeah, to reach out to people. I think that uh, a lot of people, and I, I, will, I will also extend this, please, be, be open, just ping me on Twitter if you have more questions. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer them also there. Um, is get some more experience, get some feedback around your CV, get your, as you said, ask a friend that perhaps has some experience in the area to simply do a, a fake interview um, that might uh, give the person also some nice feedback. So um, just give it a try. And, and sometimes the, the things where you don't believe in that this will work out suddenly will be exactly the job that you still have a couple of years later. So yeah, you won't know if you don't give it a go. So yeah. uh, let me just take our last couple of questions quickly here as it's time for us to wrap up. Thanks, thanks Tim, for sticking around for a few extra minutes. Um, you can also tweet at ARC or at Tim and we'll get your questions answered afterward. Um, let, Let's see, here's a two in one question. Do you ever see many people swapping roles completely, let's say marketing to product or product to sales within GitLab? Um, and do people use this technique sometimes to get into the company whilst they upskill in the background? That's an interesting question. Where is it? Sorry. It's, it's nearly at the bottom. It's from Tina, not going to try to say your lovely last name, Tina. <laughs> Do you ever see many people swapping roles completely, let's say marketing product product? Um, no, I think that they, they don't use this technique sometimes to get in the company. Might be also a thing if, if they get the, the spot in the first place, this is also fine. But I, we have had a couple of people. I, I had one of my front -end engineers. She's now a fantastic UX designer because simply her focus and her interest of developing that part was always there. And I think it's especially coming back to that, if we have a team member, we have a team member and we want to make them also um, get them into a place where they are most effective for themselves, but also for the company. So if we see that someone is simply fed up with engineering, but has a huge interest in the UX design, then we will reach out. And what we did was she was learning for a couple of months and after uh, after her maternity leave, she came back and started in the UX designing. And we had the same thing in other ways around that uh, support. As I mentioned, we had UX designers. Sometimes we give also internships internally. So people from another team start as a PM for three months to figure out if product management is something for them. And um, but of course, it's the same as every other interview in itself, and they need to be a fit. They need to get over those hurdles. And sometimes, again, it's also like, please try again in six months um, or in 12 months. And we had also a couple of those. Uh, so it, it's it's like in every other interview. And um, also don't get discouraged, but we are trying to enable this as much as possible if it works out. So. 
Great. So I think we have one last question about visa sponsorship. Does GitLab sponsor visas or just hire people where they are? Uh, we, we hire where they are uh, or if the, it depends on the country where you hire. We have a very long, countries are complex. <laughs> so countries and local laws and local labor laws and visas is a very complex topic. You can ask simply in the pro during the process our recruiter if this is a thing. Um, and also, please mention if you're just in the process of moving. We had people moving uh, who told us in the last level, hey, I'm moving, by the way. <laughs> and we need to figure out how this works. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know there are more questions coming in, and I think if we keep going, we can keep going forever. But we're going to have to pause now or stop now and take a break before our next talk. But as Tim mentioned, I don't know if you want to toss before you go, you want to toss your Twitter handle in the thread. I'll also toss arcs there too. So you all can tweet at us and get responses asynchronously, which works for GitLab <laughs> from the GitLab handbook, right? Um, we can try to answer your questions later on. Yeah. Uh, I just dropped my Twitter handle, so please feel free to uh, ping me on Twitter. Thanks a lot for the great questions, and thanks again for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, also, if you're an engineer looking for remote opportunities, you can check out arc.dev, arc.dev, and also the link, if you're more at the beginning of your career, you can check out the link I tossed in the chat for um, remote junior jobs and internships. And I want to mention that in about 20 minutes, we have our next talk, which will be Katie, VP of Engineering at Buffer. It'll be a really exciting talk, especially those of you who are Twitter users, because she's going to tell us about how she actually used Twitter to help get her engineering job there. Um, so now we'll take a short break for networking. You can click on the networking button on the left side panel to try out our speed networking feature and do little five minute chats with other attendees as you wait for our next talk. And so thank you again, Tim. Thank you everyone. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Take care.